number 175. in harmony with what we are studying today. For every grace your kindness has provided to every soul who calls upon your name. We've been studying the names of God, looking at the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. How we praise God for his ineffable names and his name of Yahweh, Jehovah. As we saw last time, the name Jehovah is compounded with seven other words in the Old Testament. Rather interesting because each one of them expresses something about the character of God in his relationship with his people. Last week we were looking at the name Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Yireh, that is the Lord will see and by implication he will provide. That is in that passage in Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham is on his journey 
to go and sacrifice Isaac at God's command. And when he gets there and raises the knife, the angel of the Lord speaks to him from heaven. And I believe that is our Lord Jesus Christ, the messenger of Jehovah, the one who in the Old Testament appeared to Abraham on numerous occasions. And Jesus makes reference to that in John chapter 8. And said, Abraham, 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 Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And the Lord said, Don't kill your son. I see now that you love me. I see now that you're going to be a man who obeys me. A man who does whatever is necessary. And for you I will provide. And he showed him a ram whose horns were caught in the thicket. And Abraham took and sacrificed the ram. And on the way to that mount... Isaac had asked the question, well, we've got the fire, we've got the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. They went to Mount Moriah. They went to the place where later the temple would stand, where the sacrifices would be offered over and over and over and over again, looking to a different mount across the valley where one who hung on a cross, God's lamb, would be able to look down into the temple and as he died, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. And the way, the access to the holiest of all was made open for God's people to come directly to him through Christ. What a magnificent picture it is. And we're told that the translation of Jehovah Jireh in verse 14, Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Yahweh Yireh, Jehovah will see. And as he sees, he provides. Because the same word is used back in verse 8, where it is translated provide. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went on both of them together. That word provide is yire. That is the same word, same root that we find in verse 14. Magnificent. God will see, and because he sees, he meets our needs. Not merely a matter of his omniscience, although it is, but an infinite knowledge coupled with an infinite beneficial interest. An infinite beneficial interest for his people. What a wonderful, wonderful thought to know that we belong to the one who not only sees us, but who also provides for us. We saw a second example of Hagar and Ishmael and Hagar is running away from Sarai because of Sarai's jealous cruelty. And God meets her at a fountain in the wilderness and sends her back to Sarai with promises for Ishmael. And here we see the verb seeing is the same root that Abraham used when he spoke of God. But when Abraham spoke, the Lord will see, it was in the future tense, not exactly the same in Hebrew, but in what we would consider a future tense. But when Hagar is speaking of it, she speaks in the present tense. She called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that he seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Bir La Haroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And literally that word, Bir Laharoi means the well of him that liveth and sees me right now. He sees me right now. So we have not only a God who knows the future, he sees our problem now and he's going to provide in the future, but he's a God who looks at us now. He provides for us now. What an incredible picture that we have of God. We saw many other illustrations of where God sees us for the purposes of benefiting his children and punishing the evil the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. He sees you right now. He not only sees that you're in church, but he sees what's in your heart. He knows what's running through your thoughts right now. 
He knows what you plan to do immediately after church. He knows how you plan to spend the afternoon, how you plan to spend the evening. He knows what time you're going to be go to bed tonight. <laughs> he knows every moment of your entire life from beginning to end, even before it happens. But if you're a believer, he knows and he sees with a beneficial interest in your very best good. Even in the times when things are difficult, even in the times when they don't seem to be going the way you thought they would go, he sees with the purpose of blessing you. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. We saw that Peter picked up that theme in the New Testament in 1 Peter 3, 12. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. It's picked up in the book of Revelation in chapter 5, verse 6, where we find the lamb standing in the midst of the throne, and it's a lamb as though it had been slain. We have Christ, the lamb, who has been slain, and yet he is standing. It is the resurrected Christ that we find in Revelation chapter 5, who has the seven horns, that's omnipotence, and the seven eyes, that's omniscience, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. He sees you where you are. He meets our needs by grace. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now today we move to the second of the compound names. We've seen Jehovah Jireh. Now we move to Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth, or the Lord the doctor. This is the root word that's used for doctors, for physicians in Israel, even today. Those who take care of the physical, temporal needs of the body when we get sick. Well, here this is the word that is used for Jehovah himself. We find it over in Exodus chapter 15. Rather interesting. We find it is after the crossing of the Red Sea. We find that there is a, a song going on and Miriam is leading the chorus. Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Rather, rather interesting, reminiscent of what happened to Hagar, but Hagar was found by a spring of water when God provided for her. But here they are without water. And then they came to Marah, and they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. Finally they find water, but they can't drink it. God's teaching them some things here as they're going through. He's about to show them in a very graphic way, how he is Jehovah the physician, Jehovah the healer. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And as you know from other studies that we've had, Moses points out, you've not murmured against me, you have murmured against God. When you're tempted to murmur and complain, especially uh, of those in authority over you, whether it's children against their parents, or citizens against their government, or parishioners against their pastor and elders, just remember who it was that put those people in authority. When you murmur against them, you are not murmuring against them, you are murmuring against God. And because the children of Israel murmured ten times, God counts the number, and he tells us, you murmured against me ten times, I'm going to kill you in the wilderness. And your children are going to inherit the land. That time when the spies came back, that was the last straw. And God said, all right, it's time for you to wander some more and die. And your children will inherit the promises. Dear people, be careful. God hates murmuring and complaining. 
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We don't have time to look there. But it's very clear there that God hates murmuring and complaining because he goes back to those passages in the book of Exodus where it occurred. And so we find here is Miriam and the children of Israel, but now they don't have anything to drink. And so Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Now people... There's a miracle that's taking place here. This is not because there was some kind of a bush that healed the waters that you can find today and when you've got crummy water, you throw the bush into it or throw some kind of a branch from that bush into it. We're talking about millions of people here who did not have water and there's a miracle where this was thrown in. It wasn't some kind of a naturalistic cause for fixing the water. It was a miracle. We'll talk more about that when we get to Exodus 15 in the evenings. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of it. And so he cast this into the waters. They were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he proved them. Now, this is not Moses making the statute and the ordinance. This is God that is making the statute and the ordinance, speaking through Moses. And said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. Now listen to the next two phrases. I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians for I am Yahweh Rapha. I am Jehovah that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Only Yahweh can bring true healing. Now what's going on here? Look at the next verse. Now we find water. They came to Elim where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees and they encamped there by the waters. God healed the waters at Marah but then he takes them to a place that has abundant water. Why did he bring them first with no water? So that they would see their need. Why did he then bring them to a place with bitter waters? It was so that they might understand when he healed the waters that he was able to do that for them if they would obey his law. That's the point that he makes in the next verse. He made a statute and an ordinance and proved them. That's the very next thing after the waters were made sweet. Why does that connect to the bitter waters made sweet? Because God says, if you obey me, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. God healed the waters to prove that he could heal their bodies if they obeyed his commandments and statutes. Now, there is a lot of medical knowledge in the Bible. It's not a textbook of medicine, but there is a lot of medical knowledge and revealed medical knowledge at that in the Bible. For example, laws of excrement disposal, that is public sanitation. There are laws of personal hygiene. There are laws on the sanitation of eating utensils. <clears throat> There are laws related to communicable disease like leprosy and quarantine. There are laws related to the sanitary slaughter of food animals. There are laws of diet, although much of that is ritual and no longer applies according to the New Testament. I'll give you an illustration of that. First Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly <clears throat> that in the latter times there are going to be three things that happen. Number one, there are going to be some who depart from the faith. Number two, there are going to be some who give heed to seducing spirits. Number three, there are going to be some who believe doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When your conscience is seared, you can no longer feel the prickings of the Spirit of God. It's seared. It's like scar tissue. It doesn't have feeling in it. And then look at verse 3. Much of this applies to Romanism. Forbidding to marry 
and commanding to abstain from meats. Can't eat that kind of meat, can't eat that kind of meat, can't eat that kind of meat. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now we might want to argue about that <coughs> verse unless the next verse were there. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Don't get yourself hung up on Old Testament ritual dietary laws. We no longer under those. We find an illustration of that as God speaks to Peter in the vision in Acts chapter 10. And you see the sheet let down, held by four corners from heaven, and it's full of all kinds of unclean animals. And God tells Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And three times Peter says, no way, Lord, I'm not going to do that. I'm a Jew. You know, I'm under those dietary laws of the Old Testament. I can't do that. I've never eaten anything. I've never had pork. I've never had shellfish. I've never eaten a bat. I've never eaten a mole. I'm not going to eat that stuff. God says to him three times, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now somebody might want to argue and say, Well, it's just an illustration. Because he's going to take him to the Gentiles. Yes, but God never uses false illustrations to teach the truth. And Paul defines for us clearly in a doctrinal epistle that we are no longer under the Jewish dietary laws. So enjoy your ham on Thanksgiving or whether, whenever you eat it. We find also there's a corollary to that. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The cross is the key hinge. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Listen to what he says in verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, we no longer have to keep the feasts of Israel. Christ fulfilled them. Or of the new moon. Or of the Sabbath days. And there were many Sabbath days, not merely the seventh day of the week. We've talked about that in our evening services. Which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Those things were all pictorial. All of those things portrayed and foreshadowed Jesus Christ what he would do, what he would provide for his people. So don't get stuck in the details of the legalism of the Old Testament and miss the spirit of the law, which is Christ fulfills this. Perhaps 40 years ago, I read a book entitled None of These Diseases by Dr. McMillan. I couldn't find it, otherwise I'd have shown it to you. I have books that literally have been packed for 40 years because I've never had an office big enough to get my books out. But that book dealt with those health issues in the Bible. And it tells us that there were at least 38 different diseases listed in the Bible, internal and external diseases. Now as we look at this, it's clearly a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the great physician. Jehovah the Helithi is our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the specific prophesied miracles of healings in the Gospels, especially in John, prove that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, the healer. Many, many verses in the Gospels say that he healed those who came to him. I'll read you just a few. Beginning in Matthew 4, and I'm just going to read through, I'm skipping many different chapters, reading these one right after another, just one verse that talks about the types of healings that he did. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those that were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Matthew 4, 24. Jumping to chapter 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. 
and his servant was healed in the self-same hour, healing from a distance, doesn't have to come in contact. And when even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. We have chapter 12, and when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Here's a mass healing. Verse 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. Again, we have in chapter 14, another great multitude being healed. Jesus went forth, he saw a great multitude. He was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Chapter 15, and great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Chapter 19, great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Chapter 21, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Those are just Matthew, I just give you one out of Mark. For he healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. Here's something else that's mentioned. How about Luke? Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Here's a doctor with night hours. <laughs> it's getting dark. You know, he didn't go home at five. He's working through the night, healing those who are sick. Chapter 6. And he came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. Man, they're coming from long way away, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Verse 19, the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went out of him virtue, and he healed them all. Chapter 8, a certain woman which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene. Now listen to the next phrase. Did you know this? Out of whom went seven devils. Mary Magdalene, who we think of in relation to the cross and think of in her ministry to Christ, she had been possessed with seven demons. And Jesus healed her. What a revolutionary change of life. And how she faithfully followed Christ after that. Luke 17, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. That's the Samaritan. Ten lepers are healed. Jesus sends them to the priest. Says, show yourself to the priest. And as they're going, they are healed. And this Samaritan, when he sees he's healed, turns around and with a loud voice praises God and comes back and thanks Jesus. And Jesus says, where are the other nine? I thought I healed ten of you guys. They were so excited, they didn't care about Jesus. They just wanted to make a path to the priests so that they could get back into society again. Jesus healed the Samaritan leper. And he was the only one who returned to give thanks. You know, I suspect it might have crossed his mind too. I'm a Samaritan. I can't go to the priest in Jerusalem. Even if I'm not a leper, I can't go to that priest. What a difference Christ makes in our lives. Jesus healed in the city. Jesus healed in the country. Jesus healed on the plain. Jesus healed on the mountain. Jesus healed by the sea. Jesus healed on the road. Jesus healed men. Jesus healed women. Jesus healed children. Jesus cast demons out of men, women, and children. Jesus healed from external diseases such as leprosy. Jesus healed internal diseases such as the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus healed plagues. Jesus healed sickness. Jesus healed from the palsy, which is a nerve and muscular disorder. Jesus healed cripples with deformed bones and broken bones and withered extremities like the man with the withered hand. Jesus healed blindness and deafness. Jesus healed mental disorders, those who were lunatic. Jesus healed emotional diseases, those with torments. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus did individual healings. Jesus did mass group healings. Jesus healed people who were maimed, those who had suffered severe accidents and were disfigured or handicapped. Jesus healed in Nazareth and Capernaum and Nain and other small towns and large towns. Jesus healed in Jerusalem. Jesus healed in the temple itself. Jesus healed Jews. Jesus healed a Samaritan leper who was the only one, as we mentioned, who returned to give glory to God. And Jesus healed Gentiles, like the servant of the centurion and the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman of Canaan from Tyre and Sidon in Matthew 15 and Mark chapter 7. Jesus is the Lord that healeth. 
Dear friends, this is our Savior. And that is how he is portrayed in the Old Testament. I want to pause here about that Syrophoenician woman for just a moment because I think most of us here are Gentiles. Did you know that when he healed her, he made a special trip out of what we might call the Jewish region into the Gentile region specifically to heal one child, one Gentile little girl of her demon possession. We don't have any other record of any other miracles that he did on that trip. But he went there to heal one little girl. He passed through the region of what's called the Capolis. That's the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. The Capolis was composed of ten Gentile cities. There's only one of those ten cities remaining today that is of note. Some of the other ones are small, they're little towns, but they weren't really cities. It was, it was an area that had been developed first by the Greeks and then by the Romans later. And there were ten cities, that's why it's called Decapolis. He traveled all the way northeast into Decapolis, and then he traveled west toward the coast until he came to what's called the border of Tyre and Sidon just outside their city limits. I want you to notice something else. I'm going to read the text in a second, but notice this. When he got there, it says he went into a house secretly. You see, to go into that Gentile house was a bad no-no for a Jew. Peter gets called on the carpet for doing the same thing in Acts chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, when Peter was come to Jerusalem. They that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and did eat with them. But as you know, Peter explained the matter from the beginning, and finally they're satisfied that God had granted repentance unto life to the Gentiles. Well, if it was okay for Peter, how much more okay was it for our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior? Now listen to what Jesus did, same type of thing. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into an house, and would have no man knew it, know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. Now how in the world did she hear about it? Jesus didn't go there to heal a whole lot of people. He went into the house and would have no man know it, but one woman found out. God can put the blinders over our eyes, of course, at any time that he wishes to do so. And he has done in the Bible many occasions of that kind of thing. But here, Jesus makes this entire trip, and nobody knows it except one woman. There weren't mass multitudes, there weren't lots of people coming, there was one Gentile woman coming. Because God had selected her and given her faith to believe in the Messiah. And she had a very specific request for her daughter who was demon-possessed, a little girl. Now, of course, Satan and his demonic forces always knew where Jesus was on earth, even if people didn't know, but she found out. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meat, to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. The children were the Jews. Christ came at his first coming for the Jews. In Matthew it makes it even clearer, because at first he doesn't answer at all when she cries, you know, Jesus, Lord, thou son of David. She had no claim to David. She was outside the covenant people of Israel. Now we find her discourse or her discussion with Jesus here. Jesus has just insulted her. Let the children first be filled, for it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. He's just called her a dog. But she answers in humility. She answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table 
eat of the children's crumbs. The mercy of God to throw us as Gentiles the crumbs which more than fill. And he said unto her, For this thy saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. And again, departing from the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coasts of Decapolis. He didn't just go straight south. He went east, all the way back to Decapolis, and then south before he came back into Israel. We have no record of him healing anybody in Decapolis. That trip, that's just not there. Don't hear of him healing anybody else of Tyre and Sidon on this trip. He was there for one person. Do you realize how significant that is for us? Jesus Christ cares about you individually. He has selected you out of all of eternity from the mass of human beings who would live here on the face of the earth. Someone who has absolutely no claim on him. This woman had no claim on Christ. Someone who is miserable and decrepit and the lowest of society, a Gentile, a woman, and it's her daughter who's demon-possessed. You know how far it is to Damascus. We've talked about Saul going from Jerusalem to Damascus. 130, 140 miles walking. And then going from that area all the way back over to the coast. To Tyre and Sidon. Jesus went that way. Healed one little girl. Turned around and came back the way that he had come. And then went south. What extent will our Lord go to to rescue us from our wickedness, our depravity, our lost, hell-bound, sinful condition? We see it here. We are Gentiles. We fit the picture. Now remember once again that list that I read a moment ago of all the different diseases, all the kinds of people, all the different places where Jesus healed. In other words, Jesus was not limited. There was not any human condition, physical, mental, emotional, or otherwise, that Jesus could not and did not heal. He was truly the great physician. Jesus fulfills the prophecies that the coming Messiah will heal physically, mentally, emotionally, because he is God, Yahweh the physician. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Jesus quoted that passage. He quoted that passage in the synagogue in Nazareth, where he grew up, as referring to himself. And they tried to stone him. Luke's 4, beginning in verse 16. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, which we just read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now listen to verse 21. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. We just looked at that list. Jesus did all the necessary messianic miracles to prove that his claims were true. 
But you know, his healing power goes beyond healing physical and mental and emotional disease. It includes healing spiritual diseases with forgiveness. Listen to David in the Psalms. The Psalm of David, bless the Lord, O my soul. This is Psalm 103. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Here we are, back to the name of God. What does his name render for us here in Psalm 103? Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Remember, he looks at us. He sees us with a goal of benefiting us. That's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will see. The Lord will provide. When he sees it, is with an infinite desire to provide for us what is best. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. His healing goes beyond the physical and the temporal. That's what we all like to, to think about is, man, God going to heal me. I got such and such a problem. I got cancer. I've got this or that or the other thing. And I'm praying that God will heal me. Dear friends, far more important is he forgives all of our iniquities. He forgives all of our iniquities. That is the center point that God is making to Israel. is not merely that he can heal them because he healed the waters at Marah. But he's the God who forgives them for their sins. What an incredible lesson for us to learn as well. Please note something else carefully. Our time is almost up, so I will have to be closing this down pretty quickly here. This does not mean that God is required to heal us physically when we demand it. That is the charismatic use of John, 3 John verses 1 and 2. That's what's called the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Even charismatics and faith healers get sick and die, but they like to use these two verses. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. <laughs> Where's the real emphasis in that verse? Even as thy soul prospereth. Wish you were well, but I'm sure glad you are spiritually healed. I'm sure glad that you are spiritually okay. I'd love to see you get well in the other ways too, but how thankful I am that you are healed spiritually. The Lord has forgiven your iniquities. He's brought you to life. You were dead. That's really sick. <laughs> and now you are alive spiritually. Perfect physical healing and the reversal of the curse in Eden will only be experienced in heaven for those of us who are physically alive today. Even when here on earth our Lord Jesus Christ himself chose not to heal certain people for specific reasons, and I can give you an example of that. Jesus did not heal the 40-year-old lame man who was brought into the temple daily for 40 years, even though Jesus was at the temple and he healed many people in the temple. We just read a few verses about that. You see, God had reserved that particular miracle of healing for Peter and John in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. He didn't just get hurt the week before, after Jesus had already gone back to heaven. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Do you think Jesus never went through that gate? To ask alms of them that entered into the temple who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us! And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk! And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping, stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. 
And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Plenty of witnesses here. And they knew, these people knew who this guy was. He was there every day. They knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had been done. Now, of course, the Sanhedrin is not very happy about this. They arrest Peter and John, pull them in. You know about the trial in chapter 4. And then verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Where did this source of power come? Was it in themselves? Absolutely not. They say so. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And then down verse 21 and 22, So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. You see, Jesus didn't heal that man, not because he was being mean to that man, not because he didn't know he was there, not because he was so busy with other people, but there was going to come a day when the testimony of Christ had to be continued when he'd gone back to heaven. And he reserved that man for that day, a man well known to all of the people who came to the temple, and he'd been there for 40 years, so that when he was healed, Jesus Christ would receive the glory and the testimony of the apostles would be heard. Verse 22, for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Well, our time is up. We still have a little bit more on Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah the physician, the Lord that healeth thee, the one who is our God and someday when we step into his presence, there will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. Because all those former things will have passed away. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are the Lord that heals us. That you are the one who heals us not merely physically, and indeed you have built many incredible processes into our bodies for rejuvenation. You've given many different wonderful things, elements here in this world, which do heal various diseases. But you're the one who also can heal directly. And you can heal us physically, you can heal us emotionally. You can heal us mentally when we begin to have dementia or other mental problems. But Father, we thank you for the most important healing of all, a, a healing that is permanent, a healing that is eternal a healing that moves us from death to life, the spiritual healing that comes as you reach down into this dark world and find us as a spiritual corpse. We have nothing to do with it. You are the one who reaches into our hearts and implants faith and life. You are the one who causes us to believe. Even faith is a gift from you. And what a healing that is, what a transformation that is, and what growth takes place in that newly spiritually saved individual as he or she begins to study your word, the food that is necessary for us to grow. As Job says, your word was more than my necessary food. Oh, Father, we pray that you will cause us to hunger and thirst after the word of God and to grow spiritually in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to him, resulting in a life of holiness and service. Father, we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is Jehovah the healer, that our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who went about doing good and healing the sick so that he might demonstrate that he is the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. We pray, Father, that you will take your word as it has been expounded this day and use it in our hearts.
to cause us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.